Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. He joins us weekly, live from New Orleans, the films are Official Competition, 18 and a Half, and Girl in the Picture. Hi, David. Hi, Jill, and welcome from down here in New Orleans, uh, where we are on what is, I guess, our summer vacation. And it turns out they have movies down here, too. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew that already because I, I've, I've been here before. Uh, more than once, but uh, it's a place that we like a lot. But um, anyway, so they have movies, and I've actually managed to go see some movies. And let me just mention that um, in some of our spare time, of which we have plenty since this is summer vacation, uh, we've been looking at some of the movies that take place in New Orleans. And uh, just a couple of days ago, we looked at one that I hadn't seen for years, Interview with the Vampire, the Vampire Chronicles, with Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. And it turns out to be better than I remembered it, and it sure is a New Orleans movie part of the way. So... uh, uh, anyway, all the little perks of uh, being in a place like New Orleans. But to the new movies that uh, that I've been looking at lately, one of them is called Official Competition. And it was directed by the team of Gaston Duprat and Mariano Cohn, and it is a Spanish-Argentine movie. And um, I have to say, I always wonder when you put out a movie with a title like Official Competition, it, it's not a very catchy or snazzy or, or sexy title. Uh, and if you've been spent many years of your life hanging around the film festival circuit, as I have, you sort of maybe know what that means because uh, that's what they always call the big prize giving in, in, in major film festivals. They always call it the official competition. That's one of the many meanings that that phrase can have. Uh, but that is sort of what it refers to in this movie, although it is also, the title is also an ironic reference to a very strong rivalry between two of the main characters. But this is a movie which is all about movies. So here's what it's about. Uh, we have a, uh, a very wealthy old man. He's just turned 80 and he's made a lot of money, but he's afraid that he's not going to be remembered for having done anything important or contributed anything to society during his long life. So uh, he gets the idea, how about making a movie? Well, of course, he can't make a movie. He's an old business executive. Uh, but, well, he'll make a movie by sponsoring a movie, by paying for a movie, by getting together the talent. And they will make the movie, and it will be a great movie, he hopes. So he doesn't have the first idea about any of this. And, by the way, at the beginning of the film, you think that this old guy is going to be uh, the main character of the movie. He turns out to be actually quite a, quite a minor character because one of the things he does, first of all, he buys the rights to a book, which he's never read and doesn't even really know what it's about, but he's heard it's a good book. Uh, and then he hires a director, and she is played by Penelope Cruz. Yes, this is a big star movie, Penelope Cruz and Antonio Banderas. So uh, Penelope Cruz plays this movie director named Lola Cuevas. And she is a big art film director. She makes very heavy, very impressive projects and sort of maybe avant-garde and the people who take movies seriously really respect her and all that. But she is maybe a bit of a weirdo. So she gets together, uh, after putting together a screenplay for the movie, she gets together two actors named Felix and Ivan. Uh, Felix is played by Antonio Banderas. Ivan is played by Oscar Martinez. And they are going to be her actors. And it turns out right from the very first time they sit down to do a little work on the script and start putting together their approach to the production and all of that, turns out these two men have very, very, very different ideas of what acting is all about. One of them really believes in, well, you could call it method acting. You have to feel the role. You have to become the character. You have to work so hard to feel the emotions in the moment that the camera is filming you. The other one says, my character doesn't exist. As long as I say the right things and do the right things, the audience will believe I'm the character. That's all I have to do. So, oh, these two guys have very different approaches to the whole acting field. And it's kind of amusing because um, in real life, a lot of people are like that, too. You have a lot of people who really believe in that, that acting from the inside out, in 
feeling the character with your soul. Jack Nicholson, for example, is one of those who has always taken so-called method acting really, really seriously. But then you have all kinds of other actors who think that all oh, that that is just silly. Uh, and there was one very great filmmaker many years ago who once said, uh, if the camera is filming the left side of your face, it's okay if you cry just out of your left eye during the big emotional scene because the audience is not going to see the rest of your face anyway. So these are very different approaches to acting and these two men embody these different approaches to acting. And as the movie proceeds, and it's a fairly long movie, it's about, about two hours or so, uh, well, about two hours, yeah, uh, the, 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 these two guys have all kinds of rivals rumors about all kinds of different things and all kinds of very interesting difficulties with their director, uh, the lovely Lola Cuevas, who does very strange things. At one point, she has the guys bring into this auditorium, uh, bring all the awards that they have won. Well, it turns out that the one who takes acting from the inside so seriously has won very few awards, but he's got some. And the other guy, who is much more popular and more of a star, has won a lot of awards. And she then puts them all through a heavy-duty shredder and destroys them in front of the eyes of these two guys who have been rendered helpless in a way I won't even try to describe because it's very sort of strange and surrealistic. Uh, and uh, But she feels this is somehow going to bring more authenticity to their work together and so forth and so on. There are some surprises in the movie that I didn't find too terribly surprising. Uh, there's moments when, um, when, when, when you're led to believe something and then it turns out, oh, it wasn't really that way at all. And I sort of saw it coming. I, I, oh, wait a minute. Now, this movie is putting something over on me right now. But that said, it's still one of the best films I've seen in quite a while. It's beautifully acted by, by that wonderful cast, especially Penelope Cruz, who is just spectacular in this movie. Oh, she is just gorgeous and she can act and she does everything. And also, it's just sort of a, a very dialogue driven movie. You have to listen to a lot of people talking, and that's good in this age of action movies. Uh, it's very, very nice to have movies where people really talk and when you really have to sort of pay attention attention when little things emerge from the actual ways that they're using words and that sort of thing. So I really did like Official Competition. It's not a great film, but I do think it's one of the very best movies I've seen so far this year. Uh, good movie, wonderful cast, and well worth seeking out. Our second movie today, I'm afraid I'm not so positive on this one, it's a movie called 18 and a Half. And it uh, deals with, and for some people, they might already guess just from hearing that title, it deals with the famous 18 and a half minute gap in one of President Richard Nixon's tapes way back in the 1970s. Uh, this is very famous, but I know that everybody doesn't know about this. So let's just go through it for a moment here. The movie is not exactly about this, but it's about this sort of indirectly. Uh, it turned out during the Watergate hearings uh, when Nixon was being accused of being involved in nefarious stuff and a cover up of the nefarious stuff and so forth and so on. And of course, at the end of all this, Nixon actually did have to resign. But it turned out that he bugged himself. He had set up a taping system in the White House Oval Office and he had taped all the conversations that took place in there. So, of course, the Watergate investigators said, oh, this is fantastic. We're going to get all kinds of evidence and information here and we're going to crack this, this thing wide open. And in fact, that is sort of what happened. But in one of the tapes, when Nixon was talking with a couple of his top aides in the Oval Office in the White House, there turned out to be in that tape a gap, a simply an erased portion, 18 and a half minutes long. Well, to this day, nobody really knows for sure just what was, certainly nobody knows what was on that portion of the tape. And nobody really knows for sure exactly what happened. It, it appears that probably uh, the president's secretary erased the tape and she always said it was totally by accident but other people said oh no it was on purpose because this would have been the smoking gun that the investigators need needed so again in the end it didn't really make a huge difference to Nixon who ended up resigning anyway they had plenty of evidence without that 18 and a half minutes but that 18 and a half minute gap is one of the great mysteries of the 20th century and it's certainly something I was a Watergate junkie back in those days I paid ferocious attention to all that stuff and it's always just been a marvelous little mystery to me as to everybody else. So that's in a way what 18 and a half is about. It's about that gap, but it's not about Nixon at all. It's about a woman who is a transcriber. She works in the White House and what she does is transcribe tapes. And uh, her name is Connie and that's her job. And she gets a hold of this tape where Nixon and some of his aides are listening to the tape that had the 18 and a half minute gap in it. 
So this is fantastic. And all this is way back in the middle 1970s when all this stuff is very fresh. So what does our young transcriber do? She's just a technician. All she does is prescribe tapes. She calls a reporter. She calls a very big deal newspaper reporter. And they arrange to have a rendezvous, to have a meeting, uh, sort of in this out in the middle of nowhere in Maryland. And uh, they're going to get together and she's going to show him the tape. So he's brought along a tape recorder, but then it turns out the tape recorder doesn't work. And also they can't listen to it sitting in a car because they can't plug in the tape recorder. This is back in the day of real to real tape recorders. So then they have to do something else about this, uh, about this. And they, 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 they take a room in a motel. So there they are, they're in this motel and yes, yeah, sure. A little bit of romance may start to rear its head along the way. And they're going to listen to the tape, but the tape recorder isn't working, so then I have to get hold of another tape. So it turns out that the only other guests in the motel, well, almost the only other guests, are this older couple, and they have a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. They listen to their bossa nova music on it when they're sitting in their room. So now they have to get involved with this other couple and coax them into lending them their tape recorder and so forth. And all of this is played, of course, a great deal for comedy. Now, I didn't find the comedy very funny. I found the, the subject of the movie absolutely fascinating, but it's all fiction anyway. And again, the comedy just isn't very funny. The movie gets a little interesting near the end when suddenly, out of nowhere, it gets really violent. And there's people fighting and beating them each other over the head with things and things like that. And it's not all that pleasant to watch, but it certainly made the movie more interesting and gave a, br a break from some of the unfunny comedy that's been going on for quite a while. So the point is, Eight and a Half is a quirky movie, a somewhat unusual movie. It has a great great subject, but I didn't find the work of writer-director uh, Dan Mervish very impressive, and uh, most of the acting was just sort of so-so. People, you know, doing a nice job, but not really getting inside their characters. So uh, if you want to see a frivolous little movie that deals with an interesting subject from bygone years, certainly if you're interested in Watergate from way back then, uh, then, you know, definitely check out Eight and a Half, but I can't say it's a movie that I can really recommend. Our final movie today, Girl, uh, Jail Girl in the Picture, uh, deals with, uh, well, it's a Netflix uh, movie, it's, so it's streaming all over the place uh, on Netflix, and it is, uh, it, it's a documentary, and it is a true crime documentary, and you know, true crime has just become one of the domineering genres of our time. Everybody's making true crime movies and writing true crime books and dealing with true crime, this and that, and there's an awful lot, awful lot, awful lot of it showing up on television and the internet and so forth. So Girl in the Picture is one of these, and it's gotten incredibly good reviews, so I decided this is one that I should definitely check out. I actually sort of like true crime, so I look at a fair amount of that stuff. And it turns out uh, to be the story of what happened when the body of a young woman was found apparently the victim of a hit-and-run injury uh, way out in the Midwest, in Oklahoma City, in fact. This was back in 1990. And uh, people start investigating. She, they bring her to a hospital. She dies pretty soon. She has a little boy, a two-year-old, uh, who is now, you know, sort of bereft. And then the movie starts to get really interesting because it turns out that this woman, this young woman who is now dead at the very beginning of the movie, was involved in an incredibly lurid and uh, unfortunate and in many ways horrifying life story that involved the man that apparently was, but maybe wasn't her father, uh, and who certainly treated her often more like a girlfriend than like like a daughter, uh, and uh, well, I even would begin to try to, to summarize, it would take all the rest of our time for me to just begin to summarize the rest of the plot. It's very, very uh, twisted, and it goes through all kinds of, of turns, and it involves a whole lot of really unsavory material. Oh, there's a whole lot of stuff at a strip club in Oklahoma, and there's a whole lot of stuff about that s supposed father and his horrifying behaviors and his relationship with a friend of this young woman who may or may not have been his daughter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have interviews in this movie with people who were involved, people who knew these people, people who were sort of involved a little bit in what was going on and want to talk about it now. Uh, there's a whole lot of reenactments where we have actors sort of going through things to give us a little more of the actual flavor of what things were like and that sort of stuff. And again, I'm kind of surprised this movie is so sort of sordid.
thwarted in every possible way. I'm sort of surprised that it's gotten such rave reviews. And I want to warn everybody, if you don't want to see something sorted, stay away from Girl in the Picture. But if you're interested in true crime, and if you want to know about some of the horrifying things that can go on in supposedly wholesome places like the heartland of America, then you might want to check out Girl in the Picture. If nothing else, a movie like this is a reminder of the kinds of horrific things that go on behind the closed doors of supposedly respectable families. Uh, and then also that go on behind the unclosed doors of places like sordid strip clubs and stuff like that. So uh, Girl in the Picture is by no means a great true crime movie. It was directed, by the way, by Sky Borgman, who does a nice job of putting the different pieces together. You can usually follow the tale pretty easily, even though it's a very, very twisted and, and, and uh, well, just convoluted story in all ways. Uh, I was involved while I was watching it. As soon as it was over, I started to forget it, and that's probably just as well, given the unpleasantness of some of, of much of the subject matter. But again, if you're a true crime buff, then Girl in the Picture might be the true crime for you. And that is my somewhat uh, criminal story this week, Jill. How criminal of you. Thank you so much, David Starrett Films in Focus, the film's official competition, 18 and a half, Girl in the Picture. <laughs>